Hi, this is Mark Birch, and this is a quick revision of Macbeth, Act 4, Scene 1. The horror of the witches is immediately reasserted through the use of choral chants, the trochaic tetrameter, rhyming couplets, the pathetic fallacy of thunder, and a sense of communion with animals as their familiars, just as they were presented in Act 1, Scene 1. What differentiates this from Act 1, Scene 1 is the additional horror that's represented through the creation of the spell and the cauldron's contents that's used to inform it. Uh, first of all, we have this toad that's been sweating poison for 31 days. Then the nature of the horror is increased by the second witch introducing a variety of different uh, body parts from initially animals. So we move from a snake to a newt to a frog to a bat to a dog, a lizard, etc. Um, not just the toad of the first witch. The discomfort of the audience is increased still further by the third witch's uh, cauldron ingredients as she takes us from supernatural creatures into human body parts, culminating in the highly disturbing extended description of a finger of a baby strangled by a prostitute in a ditch in which the baby was born. Um, one of the things that's worth noting here is that the baby would be damned as a result of not being baptised, as would the Jew, the Turk and the Tartar that are referred to in the preceding lines. So the connection between the witches and the damned is made more evident. The brew is almost concluded by the choral chant of double, double toil and trouble, um, something that's very well known to us as uh, students of Shakespeare. But uh, one of the things that people often overlook is the fact that um, it's a spell designed to double the amount of suffering in the world, double toil and trouble. Um, the use of the internal rhyme, double and trouble, could also complement the sense of excess being sought by the witches, as well as the actual lexical repetition of the word double. Everything contributes to this a sense of excess, of going over the top. And what's over the top here is the trouble, the turmoil, the horror in the world that the witches are creating. Hecate then interrupts the proceedings um, to really compliment the witches, but I'm not going to go into that too much because um, we've uh, covered that really in Act 3, Scene 5. The audience should be shocked by the second witch's next comment uh, because she says, By the pricking of my thumbs, something wicked this way comes. And Shakespeare's been at pains for the first part of this scene to establish the witches as the ultimate embodiment of evil. Um, we've witnessed the horror of their spell creations, and yet here... They're anticipating something wicked coming towards them, illustrating the extent of Macbeth's evil, given that they refer to Macbeth as such. He's dehumanised as well as something. Not a person, not Macbeth, just something wicked this way comes. The recklessness of Macbeth is evident in his treatment of the witches. He's uh, completely offensive towards them, you secret black and midnight hags, and commands them to answer him, whatever the consequences, showing his self-interest. He commands them to answer him, no matter what the consequences, even if it means that the winds uh, destroy the churches, that the waves swallow up the land, if um, the crops are destroyed, castles topple, etc., etc., till destruction sicken. He's quite prepared for the earth to be destroyed as long as he gets the answer that he wants. The masters that um, are referred to by the witches are the evil spirits that control them. Um, these subsequently take the form of the apparitions that follow. But one of the interesting things here is Macbeth's language use. He says, call them, let me see them. And the brevity of those clauses, the use of imperative verbs, remind us that the last time we saw Macbeth was in Act 3, Scene 4, where he said, uh, will to hand which must be acted ere they may be scanned. In other words, I'm going to do things straight away. There's no sense of procrastination here. None of the Macbeth that we saw early on in the play. This is someone who acts impulsively and there is no guiding conscience or guiding restriction in terms of their rationality. He just does what he wants to do. Do. The first apparition states, beware Macduff, beware the Fane of Fife. And it's interesting that this is a possible symbol of Macbeth himself, given that it's embodied as an armoured head. Uh, Macbeth dons his armour in order to face Macduff, and Macduff cuts off his head. The second apparition that essentially states none of woman born shall harm Macbeth could represent Macduff, who was, as we find out later, from his mother's womb untimely ripped. Um, it's interesting in terms of the witches potentially foreshadowing the play's conclusion by stating that the second is more potent than the first. Remember, the first we've suggested symbolises Macbeth, and if this one's symbolising Macduff, then Macduff is more powerful than Macbeth. 
Macbeth's initial response to this echoes his earlier claim that if chance will have me king, why chance may crown me without my stir. In other words, well, there's no need to do anything because fate has lent its hand. However, almost immediately he rejects this, asserting that he will make doubly sure by killing Macduff. Um, once again, this is an example of Macbeth being steeped in blood. He's willing to do anything, even if he's convinced himself that there's no need. And he believes that killing Macduff will allow him to return to a state where he can sleep, free from doubts and fears. Sleep in spite of thunder. Thunder here metaphorically representing the kind of turmoil of his brain. And we've already established that Macbeth has trouble sleeping because of the profound guilt that he experiences. And the final apparition, a child crowned with a tree in his hand, could represent the young Malcolm, with that tree symbolising the carrying of the trees from Burnham Wood to Dunsinane. What we see here um, in all of these apparitions and their effects is the supernatural manipulating Macbeth, promoting an unthinking character who believes himself to be invulnerable. So, for example, the third apparition states, be lion-metalled, proud, and take no care who chafes, who frets, or where conspirers are. Macbeth shall never vanquished be. And this then promotes this idea of Macbeth being able to do whatever he wishes to do with impunity, therefore fulfilling the kind of desires of the supernatural. We get a sense of how empowered Macbeth now feels by the fact that he threatens the witches if they don't reveal the situation with Banquo. And so the illusion appears of eight kings, the last with a glass in his hand, with the ghost of Banquo following them. Now that glass could have been used as a dramatic device to show that the line of Banquo stretches on infinitely. It's also interesting to consider whether it could have been used originally to reflect the image of James I in those first performances of Macbeth, uh, representing the way that uh, Holinshed claimed that James believed himself to be a descendant of Banquo. This is perhaps reinforced by the references within this part of the text to the twofold balls and treble scepters. Uh, both of these are symbols of kingship, but very specific symbols of kingship, given that uh, the two coronations of James I could be represented by the twofold balls, and the titles that James held of King of England, Scotland and France could be represented by the treble scepters. So you get a sense that this is again perhaps flattering James I because we see the line of Banquo extending down to him and then on to the crack of doom as if it's an infinite line um, and finally the number eight is probably significant as well because the eight kings could represent the eight Stuart kings of Scotland it's ironic that it's Lennox who's clearly the lord who's accompanied Macbeth to this meeting with the witches that irony being evident to the audience given the way in which Shakespeare's juxtaposed the scene in which Lennox criticizes Macbeth with this scene in which he's the sole companion of Macbeth Thereby, Shakespeare reveals that Macbeth has no one who he can truly rely on. Upon their departure, Macbeth curses the witches and states, and damned all those that trust them. Uh, this is deeply ironic because Macbeth's damning himself given his belief in the witches. We've already seen in this scene Macbeth rejecting procrastination, but here the parallelism conveys that strong link between emotion and action. The parallelism is evident in firstlings of my heart, firstlings of my hand. That firstlings really just implying the first thing that comes to his heart, and that heart, that seat of emotion, is going to immediately manifest itself in his hand in action. Having listened to the witches, the need to simply act is even stronger. As soon as he feels he wishes to do something, he's going to do it. And that determination is evident in the list of those that he will now kill, which immediately follows this. He's going to demonstrate no compassion. Because Macduff's a threat, he's going to kill his wife, his babes, and all unfortunate souls that trace him in his line. The aside concludes with a rhyming couplet. No boasting like a fool, this deed I'll do before this purpose cool. Reinforcing the kind of finality of this. This is absolute determination. He is no longer going to procrastinate. And those words, that image, purpose cool, um, echoes Act 1, Scene 7. Words to the heat of deeds too cold breath gives. And Act 3, Scene 4 as well must be acted ere they may be scanned. But particularly this imagery of cold and hot, he's now going to act in heat, in passion, without allowing rationality to cool his purpose. Okay, tough.